G'day ladies and gents and welcome to, well, kind of War Thunder and kind of IL-2 with Mags. So, as you can see on screen at the moment, I'm posting some screenshots from the latest War Thunder dev blog. Now, this aircraft is the Dornier 355 Fail, or Arrow, and it's one of those planes that somehow managed to get a reputation of being one of the Luftwaffe's wonder weapons. One of the weapons that could have changed the war or had a massive effect. The reality is probably not, but we'll get to that soon enough. Now, I've been getting a huge number of emails in regards to this. In fact, the last time I received so much contact from you guys in regards to a plane that Gaijin had announced that they were adding to the game was back when the Horton 229 was added. Now, the questions seem to be coming in in three types if I narrow them down. The first one is, am I hyped for it? Second one is, is it going to be any good? And the third one is the most interesting one. What the hell is it? Just another German paper plane. Well, no, it's not a paper plane. This thing was actually built and flew. So, what I'm going to do for this video is quickly give you guys my opinions on the aircraft. Now it's been announced in the devlog, I'm going to then talk a little bit about the history of the aircraft, then going to go through some of its performance, and give you a quick summary of how I expect it will perform. However, since the aircraft is not in War Thunder at this time, and this is a video format to discuss, I need something to put on in the background. Thankfully, War Thunder isn't the only World War II game. So the background footage that I'm putting up now is from IL-2 Stormovik, 1946. It's an older game, the graphics are a little bit dated. However, it did hold the record for several years for the aircraft game or simulator with the highest number of fully flyable and fully operational aircraft up until War Thunder took that title not too long ago. And it does have the DOE 355 in it as standard. So we actually have a couple of variants of the DOE 355 to show off in the background while I'm talking. Anyways, first things first, am I hyped for the DOE 355? Not really, no. Basically at the moment, I haven't flown it. Until I've flown it, I can't develop an opinion on the aircraft. Am I interested in the plane? Certainly, it is one of the most interesting designs in World War II. It looks like something that flew straight out of crimson skies and into the real world. It's a fantastic looking aircraft. It has a very interesting development history as well, considering when development for this plane actually first started. But again, I'll come on to that a bit later. But I'm pretty sure we all know how aircraft in War Thunder are. You can look at the historical performance of the aircraft. The historical performance of the Doe 335 tells me it's probably not going to perform too well within the War Thunder meta outside of being a ground attacker. Um, and in that role it might do okay, but as a heavy fighter it is... it just doesn't have the climb rate. But then again there are many cases of aircraft that were absolutely monumental failures in real life that had turned out to be fantastic aircraft, in fact some of the best aircraft inside of War Thunder's meta. So, you can't really tell. Until you have a chance to actually try the aircraft out in game, you can't tell. And I don't see the point of getting hyped about something that may not turn out to be very good. Basically, I'll do what I can to get on the next test server when it pops up for patch 1.57 and see if I can get a look at this thing firsthand, at least on the dev server. From there, once I've had a chance to fly it, I can build some opinions about the plane, having seen at the very least a preliminary flight model, if not with a finalised one. Considering that they're putting in three variants, two normal for the tree and a third premium into the game at exactly the same time, well, to announce that in the dev blog, I would expect that whatever flight model the Doe 355 will be entering War Thunder Live with is probably already complete. Whatever we encounter on the test server is likely going to be the finalised flight model. But anyways, moving on from my opinions, let's have a little bit of a chat about the history of the Arrow. So for those who are unfamiliar with the aircraft, actually are aware of what this thing is all about. So. The Doe 355 Arrow. Now this was one of the more interesting aircraft that was developed during World War II. It's a unique heavy fighter design. Basically the idea was here was to dual mount two engines down the center axes of the aircraft. So one in a puller configuration as per a normal aircraft and the second one mounted in the rear in a pusher configuration much like aircraft like the XP-55 which you're already familiar with from War Thunder. Now the idea of this design was firstly having the props on each of the engines run in opposite directions. So the lead prop, so the prop on the puller engine, would generally rotate in a clockwise direction, while the pusher engine would rotate in a counterclockwise direction. This rotation down the center axis neutralized the effects of engine torque on the aircraft while it was flying, or almost completely neutralized it anyway. There was still some due to the 
propeller shaft for the rear engine being longer than the propeller shaft in the front engine. But anyways, that's getting into some complex stuff there and it's not stuff you need to know for the history of the aircraft and its development. So anyways, it neutralized most of the prop torque which made the air aircraft much easier to handle in the air. Now the second thing was pushing both of these engines inside the smooth, very aerodynamic fuselage, not having them out on the wings, having them out exposed, reduced the drag over the overall airframe. The overall design made was sleeker, could deliver all the power of a twin engine design, while having none of the drawbacks of a twin engine design, having all the advantages of a single engine fighter without any of the drawbacks of a sing single engine fighter. It was literally taking the best of both worlds and combining it into a single aircraft. Or at least none of the drawbacks in terms of engine performance. There were still some drawbacks to the plane itself. Firstly, the plane was flown by only a single person. Now the pilot was sitting under a glazed canopy with extremely heavy framing. This restricted vision normally. Heavy framework, there was a reason why aircraft at the time were going through to bubble canopies. It was just easier to keep track of targets. The Doe 355 didn't feature anything like that. But it got worse when you considered the extremely long nose of the Doe 355 actually really affected your frontal visibility. The pilot of a Doe 355 couldn't see directly front and below them. It was impossible. And the way the rear section of the aircraft was designed in order to accommodate the second engine meant that the pilot had almost zero rearward visibility as well. The aircraft also featured a rather modern tricycle style retractable landing gear. Now, there were two reasons for the tricycle setup. Firstly, it was to accommodate the weight of the two engines on the airframe. The second was the tricycle landing gear was the easiest way to keep the plane stable and give it enough clearance during takeoff and landings to not strike the ground with the extremely large diameter propeller driving the rearward engine. Prop striking was actually such a problem during the prototype phase of this aircraft and such a concern for the designers that when they designed the Doe 355 they quite intentionally put a second vertical stabilizer underneath the aircraft just ahead of the rearward propeller. Now this vertical stabiliser did of course actually have a performance increase, it did give the aircraft much better authority and it did make the aircraft more stable. So it wasn't just there as basically a skid, but a big part of it being installed there was also to give the aircraft something else to hit the ground before the prop did should the pilot mess up a takeoff or landing. To at the very least, especially during takeoffs, give the pilot some warning that they need to push the nose down now, otherwise they're going to do critical damage to their aircraft. The aircraft itself was powered by two Daimler-Benz DB603 liquid-cooled 12-cylinder inverted inline engines, and the aircraft's standard armament was one 30mm MG103 cannon and two MG151 cannons. Additional armaments such as cannon pods could be fitted to the aircraft at any time based on mission parameters and need, and the aircraft was also capable of fielding a wide variety of ordnance for ground attack along with photo reconnaissance equipment. During its early testing, the Doe 355 recorded speeds upwards of 470 miles per hour, or 756 kilometers an hour for those who want metric, and that was with both engines running. However, when doing sh engine shutdown tests, the aircraft was able to maintain around about 350 miles per hour, or around 563 kilometers per hour, when powered by only one. Speed variance didn't change much depending on whether it was the Ford or the rear engine that was shut down. Rate of climb in these tests had the aircraft come in at about 1,750 feet per minute, or 533 meters per minute. The aircraft's optimal altitude was 26,000 feet, or just short of 8 kilometers, with a maximum altitude of 37,400 feet, or 11,400 meters. So, as you can see, the aircraft was fantastically fast, however, you can see some of the problems it's going to have in the meta already. However, we'll continue on, we'll come back to that near the end. So, Luftwaffe test pilots that flew the Doe 355 out of the Reichland test centre all praised its handling qualities in the design. Uh, they particularly noted that despite the fact that the aircraft was designed around speed, it was surprisingly manoeuvrable, at least as manoeuvrable as the Focke-Wulf 190s that were its contemporary at the time. Just before the end of the European theatre, a French piloted Hawker Tempest claimed to have encountered an airborne Doe 355. The pilot reported that he wasn't even able to close to an effective firing distance before the Doe 355 had opened the gap and disappeared into the distance. The pilot believed, based on the aircraft's speed, that what he saw was actually a new German jet-powered aircraft at the time. 
The biggest problem that the Doe 335 actually had was time. The original design for a single fuselage push and pull set heavy fighter went into the patent office in Germany in 1937. The first project to actually build one was passed its flight tests in 1939 and was accepted as a Doe P231 high speed bomber. However, why it passed all its flight tests, it was never really advanced. The project never came back to light until the Luftwaffe needed access to a high speed interceptor due to the extreme levels of damage being caused by the American bombing campaigns. As a result of that, the first prototypes didn't hit the sky until late 1943. The aircraft itself never went into full production, but limited production didn't begin until 1944. And of course, it all came to an end in May 1945, when the US Army rolled into the Oberpfaffenhoven factory, where the Doe 335 was being produced. So that is the admittedly very brief history of the Doe 335. Hopefully, I didn't butcher the German in there too much. Anyways, firstly, no, it's not a paper plane, it was built, it was built in production amounts as much as it was limited production, and it did fly. It may even have seen combat. At least one encounter described the aircraft accurately, excluding the fact that the pilot thought it was a jet and not a prop, but considering how fast it is, it's an easy mistake to make, especially if you're encountering a design that you've never seen before, and you know of the ME262. So this is a good sign for the plane for starters. Second thing was the Luftwaffe reports from the testing range. The pilots themselves compared the aircraft directly against comparative Focke-Wulf 190s operating at the time. The aircraft that were operating at the time were D-series Focke-Wulfs and the aircraft was compared favourably against their manoeuvrability by those pilots. So that is again a good sign. What isn't a good sign is the rate of climb or more specifically the rate of climb coupled with the optimal altitude of the Doe 335. So firstly let's talk about that top speed. Now combat and war thunder usually doesn't take place over 20,000 feet. It's incredibly rare to do so. That's 6.1 kilometers. The optimal altitude for a Doe 335 to actually attain its maximum airspeed is 26,000 feet. That's just short of 8 kilometers. Now, combat will get up that high. It's not common, but it does happen very occasionally in the very top of Era 4. However, it's generally only the initial passes at that sort of an altitude. After that, aircraft start rapidly heading towards the Earth because they cannot maintain flight speed and maneuverability at that altitude without sacrificing something. And what they sacrifice is altitude. Which means best case scenario for the Arrow is it's going to be able to hit its top speed in level flight in its first pass of a fight. After that, as combat descends down in altitude and begins dropping towards the Earth, it's going to lose the ability to hit and maintain that top speed in level flight. So all of this, of course, is if the flight model is done perfectly to the historical stats of the aircraft, and if they are, then I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but you're not going to be outrunning enemy aircraft at 760 kilometers an hour at 10,000 feet. It just won't be happening. At least not unless you throw a big dive in there. You're not going to be attaining that speed in level flight you'll be at best doing 540, 550 at that sort of an altitude, which will be slightly faster than the planes you're going to be fighting against, but not by a huge margin. Of course, that is assuming you're going to be able to get to combat altitude to begin with. 1,750 feet per minute, or 533 meters per minute. Now, let's frame this climb rate just slightly. The climb rate of a B-29 Superfortress is 900 feet per minute. That's 274 meters per minute. So this aircraft is only climbing at twice the rate of a four-engined heavy bomber that it will be encountering fairly commonly. The Mark 9 Spitfire, the average climb rate for one of those is 4,100 feet per minute. That's 1,249 meters per minute. That's two and a half times the climb rate of the Arrow. Oh, here's a better one. P-51 pilots are constantly complaining about the climb rate of their Mustangs in comparison to everything else. The P-51 climbs at 3,200 feet a minute, or 975 meters per minute. That's give or take twice the climb rate that the Arrow should have. So, when we think about the meta of War Thunder, speed is actually a secondary behind climb rate, and that's because the maps actually have a defined border you cannot go beyond. You are trapped in a tight arena, 
not an open world play area. So running can only get you so far, where altitude can get you much further. In the game of Raid of Climb, there was one single aircraft that I've come across so far on the Allied team that has a comparable climb rate to what the Arrow should have. That aircraft's the B-25 Mitchell. The B-25 has a climb rate of 1,666 feet per minute. It is slightly lower than the climb rate of the Arrow. Or to put it the other way around, the Arrow is going to climb slightly faster than a B-25. Again, this is providing the aircraft is modeled correctly. So, assuming that's the case, the Arrow is going to be one of the slowest climbing, well, actually not one of the slowest, it's going to be the slowest climbing German fighter in War Thunder. I mean, even the ME-410, another twin-engine German heavy fighter to compare directly against the Arrow, climbs at 2,077 feet per minute on average. I'm afraid it's probably never going to get to a combat altitude where it can use its phenomenal airspeed. It's always going to be underneath whatever it's fighting against, and whatever it's fighting against will be able to fairly easily push it down. Any altitude you lose in this aircraft, being a 7.5 ton plane, will be an extremely big struggle to try and gain back if you haven't already built up airspeed and you won't build up your airspeed before you've sort of already got the plane to combat altitude. Just basing my opinions on its real world performance and assuming that Gaijin is going to build the flight model to the specs of the real aircraft based on the performance that I have gotten from multiple sources that all correspond with one another and indicate that this is the way the plane performed I just don't see this plane performing particularly well in War Thunder's meta. It just the, the rate of climb is what kills it. The airspeed is fantastic, the armament is fine. Um, according to the sources that I've read, it was close to or almost a match in maneuverability for a D Series 190, which is most certainly not bad at all. But that climb rate is horrible. The climb rate is just not going to allow it to ever get into a position where it could be useful and that's a shame. Of course, again, this is based on historical books and some of the worst aircraft in War Thunder, according to history, were absolutely awful aircraft, yet somehow they turn out to be absolutely fantastic in War Thunder. So this isn't a guaranteed. This is just me working with the information that I have at the moment, which is, of course, the information on the real Doe 335. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. Click like if you do, subscribe if you want to see more. Fly smart, fly safe, and I'll catch you in the skies.